say, I had a birthday yesterday. Happy birthday to you. Well, I didn't say that. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Jean. Happy birthday, happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Jean. Happy birthday to you. Well, you know, that's a good question. How many more? But anyway, um, I, I want to say thank you on behalf of Sonny and myself, uh, you know, and, and to say that we're really privileged and honored to um, be here this morning. And that's true all the time that I come here, really. Uh, I could weep in terms of some of the things that have happened in this, this place. Can everybody, does everybody hear me? I want to make sure yes, that I'm, yes. I'm heard. Um, and especially I want to thank Dean, you know, who arranged our being here today. Um, he's someone to whom we look for clarity and vision about how to make this a better world. Not only with his words, but with his music. Thank you very much, Dean. Jim, thank you. And then in the 1980s, Community Church of Boston was part of the sanctuary movement, as Sonny said, and as I think Dean said. And it officially began on March 24, 1982, in the Southside United Presbyterian Church in Tucson, Arizona. And that area is still the area where a lot of things are going on. And they have never stopped, really, since the 80s. And I think we need to know that. And from that beginning, over 200 congregations in 12 denominations in 30 states were affiliated with that movement in the 80s. And Community Church was one of those congregations. And so I thank Community Church for being there then and for being here now. And may that continue for many, many, many more years. And finally, in this, this piece, the introduction here, I want to uh, say that the last time I spoke here was on December 7, 2008. And it was when uh, Jim Hardy, a good friend of many of us, and uh, a real uh, person who was committed to the poor, and particularly the poor in Latin America and Central America and lived his life in a way that uh, spoke to that. He spent almost all of the adult life that I knew him, and I knew him when he was fairly young, um, in solidarity with the poor of the world. So I want to remember Jim on this Easter, um, this Easter Sunday. And it's a day I think he would have celebrated as a sign of new life and as a sign of liberation because uh, over these years, that's really what Easter, the message, actually means. The arise, but the liberation piece is the key piece. That life is supposed to be different, not what it was before. And that's really what this struggle that we see happening, not just on our border, but in many places around the world, is. So let's bring Jim into the group. Jim Hani, presente. Presente! You see it. So the question, the first question that I want to address, and, and uh, we're going to share this, Sonny and I, and I'm going to do this first part, and then Sonny's going to do something with the slides, um, which uh, brings us to the actual uh, place, of, place that, we were, that we were in um, November, December this past year. Why are so many people seeking asylum? And I'm specifically looking at the word asylum. Okay, I want us to keep that in mind, because that's really a big, big piece of what's going on. And a refugee on the U.S.-Mexican border said it this way. We are here because you were there. If we could have a long discussion about what people think that means, but that's pretty profound. Okay. So, what did she mean by that? The reality of countries that make up Latin America 
is directly related to the policy that was forged by the United States in 1823 with the Monroe Doctrine. And that doctrine justified any intervention into Latin America, the Caribbean, or whatever, Central America, by the U.S. to protect it from any outside power, any extra hemispheric power. This was our region, 1823. Between 1850, these are, this is the statistic I have, and we can amplify it. But between 1850 and 1980, okay, there have been 69 cases of U.S. military intervention in Latin America. Military intervention. We're not talking about the other kind of intervention, but the military intervention. 69 throughout the hemisphere. We did this, and, and when you look at it, you have to look at how we fought Spain during that time, and how we took Cuba, Hispanola, Dominican Republic, everything. In Mexico, and think of it, we had a wall with Mexico, and a good chunk of our country really belonged to Mexico. And so it's a question to ask, why are people coming here? Um, did they ever leave? Many of them didn't. It's, it's, a, it's, it's an interesting question. And that mentality of this is our place, even in as far back as 1855, Nicaragua was invaded by a guy named William Walker who declared himself president. Okay, 1855, you know. And we could go on and on. But ultimately, the policy that, that came out of that uh, gave, it gave rise to a mindset. And that is no different today. And it was no different in the 80s when we were doing the work of solidarity. And there's a quote that really says it all. It was, it was said in 1927. And there was a struggle going on with the San with Sandino in Nicaragua and the whole question of taking control of that country. And the Under Secretary of State at the time, a man named Robert Olds, said, we do control the destinies of Central America. And we do so for the simple reason that the national interest absolutely dictates such a course. Our national interest, not theirs. Until now, Central America has always understood that governments which we recognize and support stay in power, while those we do not recognize and support fall. Okay. Um, Nicaragua, Venezuela, Cuba, the Troika today, the Troika of tyranny. Again, 1823. In 1946, that was expanded, that concept was expanded into what we know as Manifest Destiny. And it really was the, the religious um, way in which there could be some rationale for having the Monroe Doctrine because of who we supposedly were as a people and democratic and good, uh, a good force in the world. But we had to be able to justify that. So that came, and the U.S. and the United, and we still have people who believe this today, many people in our country, that it had a special mission from God to spread its particular brand of economic, social, and political organization throughout the Western Hemisphere initially. Okay? Manifest destiny. Well, we, again, we could, we could spend days talking about that history. And um, if you want to take a look at some of that history, take a look at uh, on YouTube, Harvest of Shame, that was done by Juan um, Gonzalez, I think, Amy Goodman's program. Uh, it's a very interesting film to take a look at historically. Now, later, Manifest Destiny, not too much later either, came to include dreams of empire that extended to the world. 
Okay? The foreign policy that the U.S. has followed, even to the present, was forged again during these years. And there we are with that today still. We've moved even further along now because now we're the exceptional, I don't know what the word is that they use at this point, you know, but we are the ex exceptional nation, the most important nation in the world. Okay. Plans had been underway as early as 1939, even before we entered the war, to create a new global economic order. We had really moved and had taken over all of the land that we could take, really. And so we had to come out, you know? It was our destiny. We had to move outward. Okay? We, we moved there from here. Okay? And we kept moving. And we had to justify it. So you've heard this before, and especially because Noam Chomsky uses this particular phrase a lot and refers to it all the time in anything he says. So he's a good reference for me. The planning that took place was called Grand Area Planning. And it was to be a region subordinated to the needs of the American economy. It had to be a region strategically necessary for world control. So we moved from this hemisphere to now looking at world control. The Grand Area included the Western Hemisphere, the Far East, the former British Empire, Western and Southern Europe, and the oil-producing regions of the Middle East. So you might say, you know, what else is left? <laughs> but that was, that was the plan. There we were in 1946, after the war, implementing it. Now, they, they went ahead and they implemented it, okay, literally. And the, the U.S. set the rules of the game. And everybody who was part of this grand area, which was the world, had to play by those rules. And those rules were designed by the United States for the interests of the United States, not for the interests of the countries that they went into, which meant not for the interests of the populations of those countries. In all of those countries, there always were elites who were in those countries and benefited by owning the resources, the land, whatever was in the country that was productive. And they did that in conjunction with the United States, and they did it in conjunction with a military institution. In all of those countries, the way we worked was to set up military regimes or make sure that the military <coughs> was supplied so that they could keep the elites in power. It's not too different today. And you know, we had to do that because as we moved out, the corporations moved with us. You know, in the old days, in the old days, um, when the people came over here to, you know, take care of this country, every place they went, they brought religion with them. And that really was very important in terms of keeping um, those countries uh, where they wanted them to be. Well, now what we do is, sometimes we bring religion, but we bring the corporations. That's who comes to all of these countries. And as they come, you end up getting, and what we have seen is what has been characterized by Latin Americans, um, particularly one of the Salvadorans that was killed in 1989, as um, developing a civilization of wealth. And what developed alongside it was a civilization of poverty. And it was the many and the few. And the many had everything, and the corporations were tied with that. The United States was tied with that. And you know, and to keep that in place, the United States had to have a setup of military bases around the world, which is why we have 800 of them now around the world. 
So it's all, you know, it, everything's connected, and that's really what I'm trying to say in this particular part of this presentation. You might say, what does it have to do with what we're here about? It has everything to do with about it, about it. At the same time that they were doing that, they were also, and this is what's interesting, we had just come out of World War II, and the West and the United States felt a little bit guilty about what happened in the war because millions of people, millions and millions of people were slaughtered, massacred during that war. We did not allow, as we're not allowing now, Jews to come in on boats who were fleeing Nazis. We sent them back, which is exactly what is happening now, or want to have happened now at the border. And you just think of it, if you tell a country like El Salvador and Guatemala and Honduras, keep your people there. If you remember the history, and if you realize that the military has never left these countries, and they are still funded by the United States of America, they are still incorporated into the military system that we have set up globally, then you are giving them and the paramilitary groups that are in all of these countries the permission <coughs> to kill them. And nothing will happen to them. Okay, so we're replaying a lot of what has already been the history. Um, sounds terrible, but you know, that is our history. And I could go on more, but I'll skip all of that. At the same time that that was happening, we also had something that was um, kind of different from that, very different. There was the, the idea of creating the United Nations. Now, that's okay, you know, you have to have institutions that you want to control with the financial, with the banks and all of that, and the United States set that up. But there was a little piece in it that I think they didn't reckon with. And that was the, um, the idea that because of the war, human rights, and freedom was really important, and we didn't want to have happen again, the world at large, didn't want to see that happen again. So they began to develop um, the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights. And in 1948, the United Nations came into existence in 45. As part of that planning, the United, uh, the Declaration was ratified and agreed to in 48, three years later. And it wasn't a legal document, it was a, a document that was aspirational. But countries picked it up, it was approved by the countries that existed at that point, which were very few, there were only about 54 of them. Everything else was a colony. Okay? And after that, those colonies had the permission really because, and again, because the United States wanted to be able to control them, um, to develop, and they thought that they were supposed to get those freedoms that were in that charter, okay? And while they're doing this planning here about controlling the world, there's also another little group here that really is not a little group because it's involved a lot more people that's looking at the world differently in terms of what the vision is. You know, they truly wanted to have a, a, a world where human rights would be respected for everyone. And that's the big difference. Up to that point, human beings around the world were not considered as human beings. And we still see the remnants of that as you listen to our president particularly, and other white supremacists, talk about these folks being animals, vermin, infestations. You know, that language that does not look at who is a human being. That's the difference. The other group really thought that those ideals would never, you know, they were just aspirational and, you know, Forget about it. So I just want to read the first article of that 
declaration because it's significant uh, for what we want to do today, what else we want to do. In article, there's only 30 articles, by the way. How many people have read it? Okay, it's not everybody in this room. It was supposed to be taught in all the schools once it was promulgated. I didn't hear about it until I was about 30 years old, and I didn't hear about it in school. And I guarantee that most of our people don't hear about it, and there's reasons for that. It's, an, it's really an amazing document. It says, all human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. Now, you would never think that if you listen to the white supremacists around the world, the nationalists around the world, and see what's happening. Article 14 says, everyone has the right to seek and to enjoy another country's asylum from persecution. Okay. Now, the definition of persecution is a good thing to look at, talk about it. And the Article 25, if you read it, talks about the whole standard of living, and really, it's the question of social rights. That's the question where you'd be grappling with the question of socialism, okay, versus the other. In the song that they sang, they talked about poverty, the wall in poverty being the evil. Well, really, when you think about it, capitalism is the evil that is stopping everything from happening right now. Capitalism. We have created, in this world right now, a civilization of wealth, a civilization of poverty. And the people coming to the border right now are those folks who have always lived in the civilization of poverty. And they became aware of that, and they became aware that they were human beings in the 70s and the 80s and the 90s, and we had the benefit of knowing some of that happening in the 80s when we were in the solidarity movement, when people around the globe were really struggling for the liberation. That attitude is there among people and the people coming to our border today and this is where it's hopeful the hope comes from those people and the people on that border who understand that those are human beings that they are people like you and like me and like them and that they have a right because of what's going on in their countries in terms of the persecution, no matter how you define that in terms of who's doing it, they have a right to be able to survive, to live. And they have made choices that are difficult choices to get up because they don't want to see their kids killed. They don't want to see them starve to death and to walk, walk, literally walk, if they have money, they'll ride. But walk to freedom. Right? That's what they're thinking. To walk to a place where they can have a different life. And we, in this country, um, do have laws that are supposed to respect that. And that's the asylum law that, again, the asylum law that we have 